Hi. How you doing? Math class, huh? Oh, there you go. Oh, your coat's terrific. The whole thing's wow. terrific. <laughs> God, have you ever seen so many dogs in one place? Uh, the trouble with you, Chad, is you're just spoiled. Yeah, I know. That's ugly. I just got the weirdest idea. Yeah, what? I wonder what she looks like under all those clothes. Who? Oh. Eldridge? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. It's kind of like the idea just jumped into my head. triangle. Can anyone tell me why Fitzgerald's name is on the bottom? Mr. Foster. Because Fitzgerald's liberated work of the 20s, beginning with this side of paradise, formed the base for the extended realism of both Hemingway and Faulkner. Quite correct. I would like to amplify this aspect of the discussion, but I see by the clock that our time is up. Your assignment due for tomorrow's class will be the final chapter of For Whom the Bell Tolls. You are to summarize this chapter with special emphasis on the protagonist's time continuum of thought processes relating to his father's death and his own impending death in Spain. Class is dismissed. Sure carry a lot of books. Yes. Miss Aldridge, you go to the movies much? Sometimes, not often. No, I do. A lot. But then I tend to think in pictures. Oh. Yeah, you see, my hobby is photography. Well, that's very interesting. I thought that maybe we it's could. It's very nice talking with you, Chad, but I do have another class. Yeah. See you. You're really serious about that, aren't you? Well, you've got any funny ideas, you better forget it. <laughs> Don't go messing around with teachers. Oh, really? Mm. Gee, I didn't know that. Going out tonight? No, I have too much to do. You know, for the kind of money they pay, you put in an awful lot of hours. That's true. Julie, Steve has a friend. He's a very nice guy. But you can't just stay home all the time. You gotta go out sometimes. I'm all right, Anne. Don't worry about me. The problem with you is you don't give yourself half a chance. If you'd work at it just a little, you'd really be attractive. Anne, have a nice time tonight. Okay. Good night. Good night.
That scene in Sanctuary where Faulkner has his character Popeye rape the girl. I prefer Fitzgerald. He only suggests violence. Well, Faulkner was just telling it like it is. I guess some people enjoy violence, lead perverted lives. And speaking of perversion, there's a wonderful old vampire pic playing down at the Village Drive-In this Friday. It's all in French with English subtitles. It's a real classic. How about going to see it with me for reasons of cultural expansion? Well, I thank you, Chad, but you know teachers aren't allowed to date students. Or, or didn't you know that? So who will find out? My lips are sealed. I won't tell. You have your pick of all these lovely coas, Chad. Why would you want to date me? Because I prefer maturity in a woman. All those others? They're just a bunch of kids. A drink. <laughs> yes, I guess I could. It's ridiculous, but these kind of things always upset me. Do you want popcorn too? Oh no, I couldn't eat anything. But a drink would be fine, Chad. Thank you. All right. be two large root beers. Okay. Easy on the ass. Two large root beers. Easy on the ice. How much is it? Dollar. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Mine too. I guess they're not putting enough syrup in them. What's the matter? Don't you like the movie, Chad? I like the movie. It's just that I like you better. <laughs> What's wrong? I don't know. Do you want to get out and get some air? something for you? Yeah, I need a room for the night, me and my wife. The name's Harker, Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Harker. You got any baggage? Yeah, I got baggage. You need $15 in advance. All right. Okay, fill out the card. Thank you. 
It's late. We're home. <laughs> Boy, you must have really been tired. How could I? Did I really fall asleep? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, this has never happened to me before. I'm just sorry that I took you to such a boring picture. I warned you, at least. I told you I wouldn't be a very exciting Tate. Forget it. I decided to let you sleep. I figured with all the work you do, you needed the rest. Still, I'm afraid I've spoiled your evening. No. I had a fine time. Well, I'm really sorry. Hey. I thought we agreed to forget about that. Yes, we did. I had a very good time. Thank you. Can I call you tomorrow? I don't think so, Chad. Why not? Because it was foolish of us to go out tonight. I could lose my job and you could be expelled. No board of trustees tells me who to see or who not to see. I do what I want. Now, Chad. No, I really must be firm about this. We can't go out again. We'll see. Good night, Julie. Chad, it's not even 8 o'clock. I want to see you. I told you last night that I don't think we should. Listen, you get dressed, because I'm coming over there right now. You and I are taking a little drive together. Absolutely not. Now, what's the matter with you? I don't find this at all amusing. It's not meant to be. Are you ready to tell me why you're behaving this way? What didn't I tell you? My hobby is photography. You drugged me last night, didn't you? How could you do something this sick? Well, I think they came out rather well, don't you? Oh, and you can keep these. Because, you see, 
I have the negatives. I'll call a police check. No, you won't. First of all, you have no proof that I drugged you. I'll deny it and offer these photos as proof. Tell them you seduced me, that you've got a thing for your students. Now, I'm sure you don't want the police or anyone else to see these. of Faulkner, Steinbeck, Hemingway, and even Hammett opened the doors to a new kind of literary expression indigenous to the new American frontier experience. Here was a raw, muscled prose which completely transformed the period and formed a direct bridge linking us all the way from from the aesthetic realism of a Dreiser to the rather disheveled classes dismissed Class is dismissed. Please tell me what's going on. Nothing. I didn't stay up all night to get that kind of an answer. I'm worried about you. It's been like this for a month now. I know, but... Julie, this, this isn't like you. Please tell me what's happening. I really can't talk about it, Anne. I want that on. I want it off. Since when does what you want count? Since now. Tonight. This second. It's all over, Chad. It's over. Nothing is over until I say it is. I don't think so. You see, I'm bored. And when I'm bored, the game is over. <laughs> bored? Mm-hmm. Not terrified, not shocked. Just plain bored. Whose idea did you think this whole thing was? What are you talking about? What I am talking about, Chad, is that you are a singularly unimaginative young man. <laughs> did you really think that that dull little mind of yours could possibly have conceived any of the rather dramatic experiences we've shared. 
Do you remember the day you watched me walk up the steps? Since that moment, your mind has not been your own. Why do you think you suddenly had the overwhelming desire to see what I looked like under all those clothes? Don't feel bad. I always get bored after a while. Although, there was one boy in Denver who did keep me amused for almost nine weeks. But then he was wonderfully creative. First, you'll experience dizziness, then mild paralysis, and then total cardiac arrest. You've drugged me! No, dear. I've killed you. chemicals, Chad. How dangerous they could be. He was one of your best students, wasn't he? Yes, he was wonderfully bright and spirited boy. You know, I warned him about those chemicals, how dangerous they could be. Are you sure you're okay? Julie, I can skip work and stay here with you. No, you go on. I'll be fine. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Eldridge? Yes. I'm Arthur Moore. I, I saw your notice on the board. And you need help. Yeah. I, uh, my lick grades are lousy. Do you have time for me, Miss Eldridge? Of course I do, Arthur. In fact, if you like, we can start right now. Oh, that'd be great. I like that a lot. Good. I think we're going to be friends, Arthur. Very good friends.
The funeral is over. And I am alone in the house. Therese is out cavorting with one of her men. On this night when father is barely cold in his casket. I ran some old family films to remind myself of when it began. Even then, at 12, she was already using her wiles on him. Poor mother, so weak, so innocent. Never suspecting the depth of evil in Therese. My spoiled sister, her sweet little face never fooled me for an instant. I knew the darkness behind it. I knew the fermenting ugliness in her soul. Mr. Anmar? Yes? Please come in. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're wondering how sisters can look so unalike. I have never found it necessary to affect the ways of Therese. Please sit down. Is she here? Oh, no. She's gone to a party. A party? This afternoon at the funeral, she seems so distraught. My sister is an unusual girl, Mr. Anma. I doubt that you truly understand her. Which is why I've called you here. What do you mean? I want you to look at something. Here's Therese and father. She was 15 then. I want you to notice the way she's pressing herself against him. I, I don't understand. Uh, why are you telling me this? My sister is evil, Mr. Anna. I think you should know that. Even as a child, she was vicious and cunning. But father worshipped her, and she him. When she was 16, she seduced him. Now, look, I don't know what you're trying to do, but I don't want to hear any more of this. It was not long after that that mother died. The doctor said it was an accident, that she had taken an overdose of sleeping pills. But it was no accident, Mr. Anmar. It was Therese. She had put those extra pills in her milk. If this is true, how could you live in the same house while they... Well, you see, I had no place else to go. I had no money and no way to earn any. No escape. So... I kept to myself as much as possible. Try to avoid Therese. To ignore what was happening in this house. You don't believe me, do you? Miss Lorimer, I don't know what to say. These books show what she is. Demonology, pornography, Satanism, voodoo, witchcraft. These books aren't just relics, Mr. Anmar. She uses them to capture the souls of others. By her own admission, Satan guides her. You don't really expect me to believe this, do you? But you must believe me, Mr. Anmar. You see, Therese's soul is damned. And I cannot help her. But I can help you. 
me, smart man. I'm afraid you're the one that really needs help. she was able to corrupt you. My sister enjoys inflicting pain, Mr. Anmar. And apparently she somehow persuaded you to share that perversion. Now do you believe me? Well, you are saved. I have freed you from evil. This afternoon, while I was out shopping, Therese violated my room in an insane act of revenge. And upon my return, raged at me, using foul and obscene language, cursing me for having dared to reveal the truth to Mr. Anmar. Her behavior was truly bestial. She's becoming more violent by the day. It's as if Father's death has released the demons within her. And I actually fear for my life. Hello? Dr. Ramsey, it's Millie. It's about Therese. She's much worse. Now, I thought we'd settle that matter. You were going to see about Therese. But you can't imagine the things she's been saying about me. About us. Us? She's jealous of our relationship. She twists it into something lewd and something sordid. Look, Millie, I have a hospital call to make in your area tomorrow. I'll drop by and we'll talk about this. Thank you, Doctor. Hi, Doc. Come on in. I've been expecting you. You want a drink? No, thanks. No. <laughs> of course not. I suppose you're here on your usual mission. I know all about what dear little Millicent told you on the phone. I was listening on the extension in my room, you see. I see. So, I guess it's just a wasted visit, Doctor. Because I know Millicent won't talk about me when I'm in the house. And here I am. Did you destroy her room? Yes, I destroyed her room. Why shouldn't I? She deserved it. I mean, where does that little twit get off thinking she's got the right to stick her nose into my affairs? Don't worry, Doc. I'm sure she's got it all straightened up by now in her proper little housekeeper's manner. Therese, this hatred has got to stop. You'll destroy yourself. Oh, I don't think so, Doc. Besides, it's really all Millicent has. 
Her hatred of me is the only passion in her lonely, pathetic little existence. You know, you're really a very handsome man. Doctor. If you just loosen up a little. Oh, did that bother you? Do I make you nervous, Doctor? I don't think we need to carry this any further. What's the matter, Doc? You still a virgin? Or, uh, is it that you just don't like girls? I'll call again soon. We don't need you anymore, Ramsey. locked in my room, silent, while she raged and swore at me. Finally, she staggered back into her own room and fell into a drunken sleep. How I loathe her. I can no longer bear to live in this house and watch evil prevail. Something must be done. Yes. Therese must die. Why did she do it? I was just playing with my dolly when all of a sudden your sister came running out of the house and yelled at me. She said I was making too much noise. Then she grabbed my dolly and threw it on the ground and broke its head. I hate her, Miss Milton. I hate her. You poor thing. Next time I'm in town, I'm going to buy you a brand new dolly. You will? Will that make you feel better? Thank you, Miss Millicent. When I returned to the house, I was still thinking of Tracy's broken doll. And it was then that the solution suddenly became quite clear. At last, I had found the ideal way. How ironic I would use Teresa's own books to destroy her. I began to collect the necessary items. Pairings from Teresa's long, painted nails. Strands from her lovely blonde hair. The rhinestone buttons from her most lewdly seductive dress. And then at last, I had all that was required. Teresa's life held literally within my hands. Dr. Ramsey, it's Millie. I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. Millie, I'm terribly worried. We must talk. I appreciate your concern, Doctor, but I no longer feel there is any need to talk. You see, things are different now. I found a way to deal with Therese. I insist that we talk. That is all I have to say to you, Dr. Ramsey. 
Your advice is no longer required. Goodbye. Millie, you in here? This is Dr. Chester Ramsey, 470 Staten Place. I want to report a death. Female, age 26. Cause of death. Cause of death unknown. family physician. I knew her quite well. Her name was Therese Millicent Lorimore. The most advanced case of dual personality I have ever seen.
he who kills. Boy, are you ugly. That face. Even your mother wouldn't love you. Get it over with. Hi, Mom. I couldn't call earlier. I just got home. Mother. Mother, it's about tonight. I know we always spend Friday night together, but I thought, no, I feel all right. It's not that. Mother, I'm not sick. Mother, there's a man. His name is Arthur Breslow. He's a teacher at City College. It's his birthday. And, um, well, I sort of promised him that, oh, we spend the night, uh, the evening together. Mother, it has nothing to do with preferring. When do I break my word to you? What do you mean, when? You give me a when, and when do I break my promises? Well, of course I love you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do, dear. Mother. Mother, I'm not being cruel. It's just, it's his birthday, that's all. I see you two or three nights a week. Mother, please stop treating me like a child. I'm grown up. I'm not yelling. Because I like it here. It's only a sublease. They'll be go they'll be back in six months. I like having it uh, uh, for my own. I, I like I like being alone. I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry. About a month. I. I meant to tell you before. Um, he's a very nice man. He's kind and gentle. You'd like him. It didn't happen that way. I, I met him after I rented the apartment. Mother, you should see what I'm getting for his birthday. It's a, a genuine Zuni fetish doll. I found it in a curio shop on 3rd Avenue. Arthur teaches anthropology. That's why I got it for him. It's a Zuni hunting fetish. It, it's really interesting. There's supposed to be some Zuni hunter's spirit inside of it. And um, there's a golden chain wrapped around it to keep the spirit from making the doll come to life. Come to life. It says, should the chain be removed, spirit and doll will become one living. Well, that's what it says. On um, the scroll. The scroll. It, it, it comes with a doll inside the box. You should see his face, Mom. Mom? Why is it always like this?
I will not get a headache. I will not get a headache. I am going to take a bath. And then I'm going to meet my fellow. And we're going to have a lovely time. Lovely time. Mom? Hello, Arthur. Hi. Well, I, uh, you know me too well, don't you? It is our one night on the town. You know, every Friday night, well, you know, I, I've told you before. I just don't want to hurt her feelings. My moving out was hard enough on her. She I know I had every right to move out. That's not the point. Yeah, I realize we we plan to spend the evening together, but Arthur, it's only one day. Couldn't we celebrate your birthday tomorrow night? I just don't want to hurt her feelings. She is my mother, after all. All right. Bye. Hooray for Friday night. What'd you do, fall off the table? <laughs> Where'd you go? I found you. At least the tip of your spear. But how you got that far back? We're getting warm. Come out, come out, wherever you are.
that you, little man? What's going on? Spooky on me, Amelia. Wooden dolls do not move about. <laughs> that ball probably just burnt out.
This is Amelia, Mom. I'm sorry I acted the way I did. I think we should spend the evening together just the way we planned. It's kind of late, though. Why don't you come by my place and we'll go from here? <sighs> no, I'm all right. Good. I'll be waiting for you. Thank you.